Um, so tonight we have a special guest, Michelle C. Smith is in the house. Woo -woo! Um, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Welcome, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're super pumped to have you. So the way tonight's going to work is um, I'm going to go through a little bit of a bio about you. And then after that, uh, we'll go through some really informal questions. Um, and then uh, Tammy always puts together this awesome slideshow and like video show of <laughs> your past and, and your present. Um, and then after that, we'll do a rapid fire questions, just like a little, get a little bit to know you a bit more. Um, and then, Wonderful. and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask some questions too. So cool. Yeah. Let's so that, do it. All right. Okay. So, um, I will start off with your bio. So with today about Michelle, she's an actor, stunt woman, educator, entrepreneur, and former baton twirler. Uh, since Michelle was five years old, she has been training to create a level of mastery around a very unique and valuable skill of object spinning and manipulation. This training is an asset that she uses every single day in her life and work with or without a weapon in her hands. As a world baton um, champ, world champion baton twirler, uh, turns professional stuntwoman, martial artist, and educator, Michelle has used her unique skills, presence, and powers on many well-known movies and TV shows. Because of her highly specific training and skill set, Michelle is known for being one of the top professionals in her industry. She has seen the immense benefits that 30 years of training with various tools, weapons, and movements has gifted her. And she is so passionate about sharing these gifts with others. This passion led to Michelle to create freestyle staff spinning, a weapons-based practice that combines the best technical baton twirling with martial arts and acrobatics. The aim of freestyle staff is to create an open and accessible space for all kinds of people to discover and fall in love with the art of staff spinning, weapon spinning, and even baton twirling. So if you haven't already, you can follow Michelle and the badass community of freestyle staff spinners in the online badass academy on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. So without further ado, put your hands together for Michelle Smith. Woo! Yay. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> we are so excited. Like I am beyond excited that you're here. Um, I mean, uh, May 4th just came and passed and like that Star Wars day. And for those of you who don't see, I have my Kylo Ren shirt on cause I'm geeked out in my Star Wars wear cause I'm <laughs> a huge Star Wars fan. And whenever she posts anything about lightsabers, I'm like, ah! so anyway, <laughs> all right, questions. Tell us where you are from and what you were like as a kid. <laughs> oh gosh, it's a good thing Loren isn't here. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm from Red Deer, Alberta. That's where I grew up and where uh, I was based for all of my competitive career. Um, we trained in Calgary on the weekends because we needed bigger gyms. But yeah, I'm from Red Deer. Uh, what was I like as a kid? Well, uh, I was told multiple times over the course of my entire competitive and professional career that I had a bad attitude. Uh, I was very opinionated. I had a very clear vision of what I wanted, even from a young age, and that's been really helpful for me in my professional career. Uh, I was a hard worker when I wanted to be, uh, but I really loved, uh, what I really loved about Baton was the artistry and how I could combine movement with these really difficult skills. I really loved contact and roles more so more than big tricks. I loved the events where I could move around on the floor rather than standing still. I wasn't necessarily interested in twirling super fast. It was more about like how can I connect to the music and create art with this and that's something that I think uh, having someone like Loren Dermody as my coach was was a really great fit for me. Um, but yeah, I was very artistic. I loved dance. I loved dance, except for ballet, but I loved to dance. And um, yeah, I was, I made it known when I was displeased about things. <laughs> but, you know, 
I was also very determined and hardworking, so it worked that, out for the best. That you were. Um, I had the pleasure of going to a couple of world championships with you, I think in Italy and uh, in Hawaii. Hawaii, yes. Yes, I remember actually you burned so bad that I ended up having to peel skin off. Yes. <laughs> at one point, do you remember that? <laughs> yes, I do. We had fully had second degree burns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, but, and you know what? It's funny that you say that because I remember you were a pretty feisty kid. Uh, you came up to me one year, I think it was maybe in 90, oh gosh, I want to say 93 or 94, and um, you gave me your little, um, it's like a hockey card, but for baton yes. and yes. you had a little red costume on, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and you gave it to me, and you told me, I really like that you love roles, and I'm like, I really love that you love roles, I'm like, what's your favorite role, and you told me, it's the long arm role, I'm like, I love anything to do with long arm roles, so that stuck with me, and like, here we are. I'm like 45 years old and I still remember that. So yeah. Oh, it's, wow. Yeah. Crazy memories. Um, so tell us how you got into baton. I don't actually remember how I got into baton. I, I remember my first day of baton. Uh, when I've asked my mom, this is a question that comes up quite a bit. Uh, when I've asked my mom, she doesn't necessarily remember, but I think I had seen some sort of performance and was like, I want to do that. And my mom was a flag twirler in high school. She did uh, oh. a, like a, 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 maybe a watered down version of, of Color Guard. And so I think that she was inclined to put me in something, but I do remember going on my first day, walking into the gym, being handed a baton and being like, what is this? Who are these people? And <laughs> that's what it was from there. And I, I, I wouldn't say that I, I loved it at first. I can tell you that I didn't but I was also born left-handed and and you start a lot of things in your right hand when you start baton and so it, it took me a little while to for my brain to catch up yeah. and then once I started my coordination sort of picked up and I, I started seeing the improvement getting better then I started liking it but I think the first couple of years I was like mm, I don't know about this but my mom kept taking me <laughs> that's so funny that's funny um so left-handed people unite uh, alicia's a lefty i'm a lefty so Yay. yeah yeah baton there's a place for people with left hand or who are left-handed um okay so your coach was lorenda mini was she your coach for your entire baton career uh pretty much she came to us when we were about seven uh, when holly and Ch chelsea and i were seven uh, we were coached by Denise Sinkovicious before yeah. that. So from like five to nine, maybe eight or nine, uh, we had Denise and then Loren came when we were seven. So for a couple of years, we had Denise and Loren. And then after that, Denise moved on and Loren was our coach from then on. That's awesome. Uh, for those of you who know Loren, she couldn't join us this evening because she's at an acrobatic arts training, but she says hi to everyone and she's really sorry she can't miss, she's missing it this evening, but uh, yeah, she um, she was more than happy to help contribute photos for uh, the slideshow. Um, so tell us who your, support, your supporters were when you were twirling. When I was twirling, uh, I, my mom was wonderful. Uh, she, to this day, is my biggest fan. She drove myself and my two teammates, Holly and Chelsea, all over the place when it was her turn. She made it work financially, uh, which I found out later uh, as an adult that it was a struggle. So my mom is is pretty high on the list. Uh, Lorenz really high up there. Uh, Holly and Chelsea are also there. I think we all leaned on each other. We spent a lot of time together and so I didn't really have any sort of friends or a circle outside of that because we trained every day uh, for so long. So those were my people and and I, I'm really grateful that they were people that I could lean on and they could lean on me as much as possible. Um, I did have really wonderful dance teachers, uh, Judy Dorland and Shanda Albers, who were a part of that and and also everyone around Canada was was a huge part of my my upbringing and my baton career because like I, I know we would only see each other certain times of the year at certain competitions but uh, there was always 
uh, an excitement and I would always be looking forward to seeing my friends from across the country and and I wanted I wanted to impress people so I wanted <laughs> I wanted to be good I wanted to make sure that I wasn't dropping the ball and be part of the cool kids club uh, which I hope I made it I still uh, don't know yeah, if yeah, I made yeah, it <laughs> you made it you made it <laughs> for Excellent. sure thank you <laughs> so what is your best baton memory Oh gosh. Um, I would say my best baton memory, I think, would have to be Worlds in 99. Uh, it was a baton, not a ball. Thanks, Stephen. <laughs> uh, very true. I was very good at dropping my baton, though. Uh, I would say Worlds in 99. And I say that because it was my last year junior. So there was this excitement about moving up to, to play with the big kids. Uh, I felt like I had improved a lot and I felt very confident that year. Um, and I placed really well at Worlds. We won pairs that year. So it was just like a good year overall. And I competed my freestyle. That was one of my favorite freestyles I ever did. And I competed that freestyle really, really well at Provincials, at Canadians, and at Worlds, which I'm really happy about because I was sometimes pretty inconsistent, especially at Worlds. Uh, but also my very first trick in that freestyle was a four turn catch and walkover and I cheated it at every competition until worlds and I had a conversation with myself before and I'm just like you just got to go for it you got to do it it's it's not going to be as fun if you just catch it and do a walkover so you got to catch it in the walkover and I, I made a deal with myself and I did it and uh I caught it all three rounds. Amazing. <laughs> it's the very first trick. So I was just like, yes. Amazing. Um, so that I would say that that was probably my most successful competitive experience. And um, and the, the, the experience where I really felt like I stepped up in a, in a good way. Mm. Um, you know, you try to every now and then and it, it doesn't quite work out for you. But that one, it, all the sort of stars aligned for me and it, and it worked out. Incredible. Which routine was that? Uh, that was the blue one to Vanessa May Storm. Oh, like the Vivaldi remix. Yes. Oh, that yeah. was like my favorite routine. So good. So good. It was really good. And it's one of the routines that I actually have footage of from Worlds. That's of me catching a four-turn catch and walk. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so I'm like, That's see, awesome. I did it. <laughs> I actually still remember some of the choreography to that, like the posing and the... Um, <laughs> and the yeah, yeah, the balances. Yeah, balancing. Yep, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was a great routine. Very... Yeah. Yeah, that Solid. will be yeah. stamped in, in the Baton Legacy world forever, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So when did you retire? I retired in 2003. So that was a little while ago. Okay, yeah. And so after you retired and before the success of your freestyle staff spinning Badass Academy, um, fill us in with what you did uh, within those years. Okay, well, uh, prior to retiring, I was going to retire in 2002, uh, decided to just do a freestyle for the next year. I kind of just wanted to try something different and then just didn't feel satisfied uh, with my career my competitive career, I was notoriously super anxious, especially at Worlds. And I felt like, well, if I just try one more time, that's a whole other tangent right there. Uh, but in between 2002 Worlds and 2003 Worlds, I went down to LA for a couple months and was considering moving there because my plan was to be a professional dancer. I was sure I was going to dance for the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> It was, that's what was, that's what I was going to do. And when I want something, I make it happen. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I went to LA and started working on a work visa, realized uh, it would probably be to my benefit to be somewhere, not in Alberta, like Vancouver or Toronto. So I moved to Vancouver, started dancing. Uh, by the time I got there, the Backstreet Boys were not cool anymore. So <laughs> they're not cool anymore? What? Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're still around, but yeah. they, they weren't actively hiring dancers like they did in the 90s. Right. Uh, things had shifted a little bit. And right. so I danced for a little bit and just wasn't, I just needed more. I just felt like I had all this skill and um, potential that I wasn't using in dance. And I was a very technically trained dancer and 
a lot of the stuff I was doing wasn't technical dance and I wanted to kick, I wanted to jump and like do the tricks. So through dance, I did like a tap show for a couple of years and did all that. Uh, I got into circus. So then I started doing circus. And the great thing about circus was I wasn't really doing baton at all. I like, I, it's understandable that you retire from a sport. You kind of like put it down for a second. It was nice to do something else. Uh, but in circus, I got to experience performing at a professional level. I got to experience being a working performance artist in my 20s, which was, it's, that's a feat in itself, especially yeah. in the entertainment industry. Uh, but I got to experience performing other skills and apparatus at a professional level and sort of taking note of my mental state. So uh, like doing silks in front of people. I'm like, wow, I literally, like the first time I performed on silks, I had only learned silks a month before that. And then I was performing it. Wow. And uh, like, because of the athleticism that just sort of is inherent with me and that I've spent a long time training and sort of the gifts that baton gives you, I was able to learn it really quickly, but I was also be able to perform it at a high level really right. quickly. So I spent some time, I spent almost 10 years doing circus. I did silks, I did hoop, I did a contortion act. I am not a contortion act. A contortionist. I did a handstand act. I did a hand-to-hand -hand, like partner partner balancing act for a really long time. I had a rope act. Like I was just performing all the time and it was really, really great. Uh, I learned a lot about professionalism. I learned a lot about like how to like shift on the spot because things go wrong in live performance and sometimes things are weird. Uh, I've done embarrassing things. I've worn embarrassing costumes. I've done it all. <laughs> um, and then circus sort of led me to stunts. And I had always wanted to work in film. It was one of the things when I first moved to Vancouver, I remember driving past the film studios and being like, I'm going to work in there one day. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I thought it was going to be acting. I didn't know stunts existed, honestly. And so somehow the circus and the stunt world are actually fairly closely connected here in Vancouver. And so I started meeting stunt people and I kind of had a choice. Mm -hmm. it was, I was around like 24, I kind of had a choice. I could pursue circus and go to the National Circus School and do that, mm -hmm. or I could do stunts and I chose stunts. And as soon as I chose stunts, uh, I got booked on a feature. And so that was the confirmation I needed that I was going the right direction. Um, and the great thing about stunts was you have to learn how to fight. You have to know how to fight and fall yeah. down. Falling down was the easy, easier part, but I had to learn martial arts. And then I started learning how to fight and was like, where has this been my whole life? I needed this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really needed this. I started with Muay Thai and cool. kicking things. Kicking Amazing. things was, was a great thing. And then I just sort of kept walking. I've never stopped since I was five, I've never stopped training. I've never stopped pushing forward. I've never stopped having goals and the capacity be, capacity of what I could do with the skills that I have. Uh, and somehow, here we are. That's amazing. <laughs> All these years later. So awesome. Very cool. Um, so if someone came up to you and said, you know, I think I want to go into stunting, like what would you recommend for them to do? Um... <laughs> well, <laughs> do you really want to get into stunts? I, I do get this question a lot, and I'm always, always, always happy to sit down with somebody and sort of explain how I did it. Uh, it was not easy. And so if somebody were to want to get into stunts or film in general, but I will talk about stunts, uh, you have to be prepared for the long haul. It is not an easy industry to break into. There is no stunt school. There is no stunt agent. It is all about networking, creating connections, and then having the skills to right. back it up. So you want to be a stunt performer, you have to know how to fight. Like cannot be a stunt performer and not be able to fight. You have to be able to fall down on cement. You don't get pads all the time. Uh, and you have to be willing to be constantly training and acquiring new skills. So that's just sort of the physical side. But then you also have to be willing to create connections and relationships. Because essentially, 
stunts because we don't have agents. We are completely um, uh, independent. Free, yeah, yeah, free contractors. Um, so you have to, it's you, you got to push. And if a stunt coordinator has a show and they need a bunch of people, they're going to hire people that they know because they know that they can trust those people and they know that those people are experienced. So if you were a new stunt performer, that's really hard to break into that. So that's why it's really important to create relationships because a stunt coordinator is not going to hire you if they don't know who you are and they don't know that they can count on you when it counts because things move very fast on the film set and there's a lot of money involved and time is money. And if you can't get it right, somebody else will. So thank you very much. Please leave. Somebody will come in and take your place. And mm -hmm. the work that you're doing is inherently dangerous. So mm -hmm. you, you have to make sure that you are ready for that. And in my experience, the more you sort of hold back on, on something, say you got to fall on the ground, the more you hold back, the more painful it's going to be. So you have to be able to sort of override your natural sense of survival and just sort of shut your brain down and just go. Right. And so it's not for everyone. And I don't even know if it was for me. So <laughs> I'll just say that. Well, you do an awesome job doing Thank it. You. Um, Thank you. All right. So I read on one of your Instagram posts that uh, success is born of struggle. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about some of your struggles you've had to encounter? Like, were you a starving artist? You know, like oh, like anything that you've had above. To... Um, okay. The biggest one, okay, the biggest one that sort of like goes with the story of my life and goes into the book that I will write one day um, is uh, the story of anxiety. The struggle that I've had since I was very young with anxiety, performance anxiety, like, basically just chronic anxiety and I remember the very first time that I realized that my hands were sweaty and that was a thing that I dealt with for my entire baton careers my hands were so sweaty and I didn't take my batons when I was competing so it was a recipe for a disaster but I remember the moment the first time that I was like oh my god like I am nervous and my hands are sweaty and it was in 1995, I was my first junior A freestyle. I was at nationals standing, we're in Saskatoon, standing behind the curtain, it was green. And you know, they open the curtain and they call your name, you pull up and you go to your post. I was, it was there and Loren was with me and I was just like, my hands are sweaty. And, and I just remember her saying something like, oh, you'll have to start using rosin. And like that, it never went away after that. My hands are sweaty now. Like it's still a thing for me. And so a big thing that I have always asked myself of like, what's the deal with the performance anxiety? So I was notorious for just falling apart, especially at Worlds, uh, pretty much only at Worlds. At Canadians and everything else, I was fine. Uh, and so a lot of my professional career, there is an element of, um, me trying to figure out what that is. And so I've unconsciously chosen pathways for my um, professional career that have forced me to really face what that performance anxiety is, like circus, uh, like stunts, where I can't have performance anxiety. I have to be able to do it now and, and do it well. And the irony is, is uh, I didn't really realize I was doing it at the time, but I have become a performer within the film community that's known for working really, really well under pressure and can do it on the first try, like wow. like one take wonder. And and it's sort of sort of ironic because that's not the story I have about my baton career. My baton career, my story is like I just couldn't keep my baton in my hand, and my professional career is oh, I know how to do this. I can do it. But I, like somewhere along the way, I figured it out. So that's one of my biggest struggles. And it's not something that will ever go away. It's something that I deal with uh, on a regular basis. I'm not performing as much as I used to. Um, but when I do, there is a process that I have to go through in order for me to be super present and focused and in it, in the moment. And I didn't have those tools 
when I was competing and, and it took a, a, like decades of working professionally to figure it out basically. Sure. And I still don't even get it right all the yeah. time. And there's some days where you're less nervous and there's some days where you, especially stunts where you're like, mm -mm, mm -mm, don't feel good. Don't feel good. Uh, but I've learned to trust that and trust those feelings. And so my preparation will be different based on how I feel. Uh, so that's my, been my like biggest overall life struggle, but like there is struggle in just wanting to be good at something about there's struggle in, in creating mastery behind a skill that you have any skill there. There's going to be days where you practice and say for a baton, cause that's what we're talking about, where you just drop it and drop it and drop it and drop it and drop it. And you just can't even catch one that's struggle. But if you don't go through that process, if you don't drop it 10,000 times and sort of catch a like not very decent one, but you do catch kind of one, if you don't go through that, you're never going to push to that next level. You're always going to stay exactly where you are. So there, in order for you to reach the top of the mountain, you have to struggle up the mountain a bit. And it, it's part of the journey. It's part of your way and your experience to mastery because once you have struggled you gain wisdom you learn so much about yourself in that struggle you learn how you deal with that struggle and then you start to see the contrast and and if we all did life like this it would be very boring and it wouldn't be very fulfilling so you need really high moments and you need moments where you're down so that you know what is going to lift you up and I think that is one of the gifts of becoming a master at what you do is because you have struggled and then you have so much more compassion and empathy for the other people who aren't quite up the mountain yet, but they're working their way up there and you can sort of empathize with them. For and sure. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I think that whole, um, sharing that you have had to deal with anxiety and, you know, just the whole mental portion of that. Um, I think probably every single athlete has gone through something like that. And mm -hmm. the fact that you are oozing confidence and like you are, <laughs> like you are um, a master of your skill now, you know, I feel like that could be really expi expiring, inspiring for, yes. for, um, you know, athletes and even me, I like, I, I, like, after you talk about this, I'm like, I want to put me in coach. Like, I want to run. Yeah. Like, let's go. Yeah. And, and it's applicable to every stage of life that you're at. It's not just competition. Competition is, is like the stakes are so high. And, mm. and like, what we're asking from athletes so young is, <laughs> I'm getting text messages now. Uh, but what we're asking from kids at a young age is is really really challenging and and so, so for someone like me we're like I just didn't have the tools and what it comes down to like you said is confidence if I would have gone out there and done my freestyle at worlds like I knew that I could and and confidently stepped out there like that one time in 99 where I was able to do that mm -hmm. uh, I would have had a much different experience with worlds and sure. you know I dropped a lot and somehow still got fifth and like imagine if I would have caught my baton what I could have done yeah. and that's just something I'm gonna have to live with I'm absolutely not gonna go back to compete having this knowledge now there's no way um even if baton made it to the Olympics I still couldn't do it um but I know that now and and so that's where I get to like look at all the things I've done because I figured that out but what it comes down to is confidence yeah you just got to believe in yourself and easier said than done of course but yeah for that, sure. that's the bottom line yep absolutely okay so um so when I asked you to do this inspiration series you had 545,000 followers on Instagram yes. and that was about maybe just over a month ago mm -hmm. today you have 586,000 um, followers on Instagram. That's yes. like 45,000 more followers within a month. Um, mm -hmm. How important has social media been to you to develop your ideas? Uh, very important. I started posting on social media, I think around 2000. Or it was when I was Sorry. 14. <laughs> I looked, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I started because I hadn't been uh, 
basically what happened for me when I started stunts and got into sort of the martial arts realm is the feedback that I heard was don't tell anybody you're a baton twirler because people won't know what to do with that, which I disagree and kind of agree with. So I didn't, for the first half of my stunt and like film career, I didn't really say anything about it. I was just working and just putting in the work and taking whatever gigs and, and earning my stripes that way. And I'm really glad that I did that. But it was around, it was after I had gone to Spain and walked on the Camino to Santiago and was really feeling this like dark space. And I felt like there was a piece of me missing. And what I realized it was my batons. It's like this thing that's been a part of me for so long, I'm not doing it. And this thing that allows me to uh, express myself and create, I'm not doing. And so no wonder I feel awful. And so when I got back from Spain, I was just like, I'm going to start sharing this with the world because it's awesome and people need to see it. And using my batons wasn't interesting to me. It was because I was also doing a lot of martial arts at the time. So I was all about the weapons. And I think the very first like spinning, like I did like a little flat contact section when I was working on Deadpool. So that would have been like 2014 or 15. Which is uh, pretty flippin' awesome. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, we were doing this rehearsal in some junkyard full of tetanus uh, and we were just standing around and I was just like, ooh, <laughs> stick. And then I filmed a video and I put it online and I just started receiving a lot of feedback. And what I was realizing was there is, and I've known this my whole life and it's sort of felt like my entire professional career was sort of building up to this moment where I was like able, like I acquired all these new skills that I wasn't able to get when I was competing full time. And then it's like, okay, now how do you put that together with what you already know how to do, which was the baton side. And so then I started posting and it wasn't really about gaining followers. It was just me exploring my own creativity. And if you watch my videos, you can see how they've evolved. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not even done evolving, but I have a much clearer idea of what my style is. Uh, but yeah, it was really just about having a space to show my art, that, that was it. Uh, and then I kind of started realizing, perusing the internet, that there is no education for technical staff spinning. Like there is none, there, there, you gotta admire this, but there is a lot of self-taught people who have just watched videos so much that they've taken skills and broken them down on their own, which is amazing. I would. I don't learn off tutorial videos. I learn with a coach in person, but people have done this, but there's no supporting technique. So there was a lot of like variance in skills. And so I saw a window for myself in there. So then I started doing tutorials in like 2015, 2016 with the intention of building an academy, which I built two years ago with the Online Badass Academy, where it's a staff spinning all the way from like very beginner level it will go all the way to advanced level but right now it just goes to the intermediate level it's just going to take me time to build that um but yeah it, it was really just about having a platform to just sort of show what was interesting and what I was working on right now like that's really it and then once I had a couple of videos go viral then I started treating it more as a business thing and that's what I do now like my Instagram and my TikTok they're business uh, but what I really like is that it allows me to connect with people whereas I could not anymore but like I used to have online or group classes in person but I only can reach a certain amount of people in my city but the beauty of the internet and the beauty of social media is I can reach people all over the world and this is a skill that people resonate with all over the world oh, so social totally. media has it, yeah and it's allowed me to start reaching new places and yeah it's it's just it's, it's about consistency mm -hmm. you have to be posting often and you have to be posting regularly and sometimes videos hit sometimes they don't uh, my TikTok actually has more followers than my Instagram, but my videos don't get near the same amount of views as my Instagram does. So like really 
the amount of followers doesn't actually mean anything. It's about the value of the content that you're putting out there. And if you're not looking for a lot of followers and you just want to post your selfies and your, your lunch with no hashtags, totally fine. <laughs> but if you want to use it and grow it, there's, there's just certain strategies like proven strategies that mm -hmm. will help you do that. And I've just sort of researched those and followed those and tried to keep up with the trends and tried new things. And um, I You're think doing a that- a phenomenal job. Thank you. I think that I found my, I found my niche basically, yeah. but that took me because maybe this time last year, I was only at like a hundred thousand followers, which is still a lot. And I will say that 45,000 followers, new followers now is sort of indicated by the amount of followers I have. And it's easier to gain more followers, the more followers you have. Right. If that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. So when you're it, it, the first 10,000 is the hardest. And then once you get past there, you're sort of like in the algorithm and it starts right. feeding you to more people. But like, if you only have a thousand followers, it is so difficult to get mm -hmm. eyes on your yeah. stuff because it's just, that's just how the algorithm works. For sure. Oh, this is all just so fascinating to me. Like, I, it's so awesome. And, you know, I think the thing that resonates with me is that you have people from all around the world, all walks of life, all yes. types, colors, disabilities, you name it. Mm -hmm. And like, they feel valued and respected. And like, I feel like you always acknowledge them in a positive way, which I love. I actually look forward to your Instagram um, stories the most. Like, you oh, know this. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've been fangirling you since 2014. I know we haven't <laughs> touched, but like, I, I can say as a part of the baton community, we are all so, so proud of what you've been accomplishing. Oh, thank you. And I appreciate that. We can't I wait to see what you do. Um, well, it's definitely something that I, I try, I want to make space for. That is one of my businesses and my personal core values is accessibility. Um, I feel like maybe one of the reasons why baton is struggling is because lack of accessibility. And it's not a conversation I'm here. I don't really go much into the baton forums uh, at all, but I, I'm not hearing much conversation about that. So yeah, just throwing that out there. Yeah, uh, no, But sure. yeah, I want it because like, we all know we, we've practiced in gyms. We've had to negotiate space with basketball players or like when we were training in Calgary, there was this badminton family that we were always sharing space with. And you always know, people always stop and are like, oh my God, that is amazing. That is so cool. And you're like, yeah, it is. Yet it, it's, it's not out there for people to learn. So maybe if it were in a space where, where it is accessible to people, more people would jump in and that's what's happened. And yeah. it is really important to me to make sure that um, everybody gets an opportunity to be highlighted and be seen. It's a stick. You can yeah. get a stick anywhere in the world. It has, there is no boundaries about that. And I feel like for me, it, it's because that's one of my core values. It's, it's really important. It's a priority that I make sure that people feel safe and feel included and it feels like an open space. So it's something that, that I have to maintain. And if somebody's not maintaining that, bye. Like yeah. you're not, you're not in this space this is a space for people who are going to support each other. And it's, it's just about creating and cultivating that community and cultivating that. Um, well, I don't want to say rule, but like cultivating that energy around mm -hmm. it. And then as the leader, it, it, I got to walk my talk. I, I have to maintain that space as well. And so, for sure. um, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm glad that people noticed. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. I work in HR, so I, you know, I, I <laughs> truly, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Like, and you make it a big point in your, in your posts about, you know, uh, what you stand for as far mm -hmm. as diversity and inclusion and yeah. And so for me, that hits me here. Um, okay. So moving right along um, to some lighter stuff here, twirling your lightsaber has caught the attention of Mark Hamill, who yes. is the original <laughs> Luke Skywalker and, uh, Daisy Ridley, who played Ray, and mm -hmm. um, like for me, I'm just like, ah! yeah. so that's pretty <laughs> awesome and incredible. Um, tell us about that when you found out. 
Uh, I sort of, because the Mark Hamill thing was on Twitter. So I didn't find out until like days later where I, I could have really like capitalized on that, but I didn't find out till later. And then people were sending me screenshots because I don't use Twitter. Uh, but the Daisy Ridley thing was interesting because I was actually, I was working on a show. I was on set and my agent called and said, hey, Wired uh, just reached out and they want to know if they can use this video, send a clip, uh, in a video with Daisy Ridley, she's gonna watch it and react. And then they sent me the clip of her reacting. So she had already watched it. They had already done the clip and then they had to come to me to ask as the copyright owner to ask permission to post it. Um, so of course I said, yes, <laughs> but it was just like, what is happening right now? And I was on set and I was at work. So I was kind of not like, I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine, that's fine, whatever, whatever. Uh, and then I went home and then I watched the video and she said my name twice. I know. She said my name with Michelle Pfeiffer's name and Catwoman. And if any know, anybody knows anything about me, Michelle Pfeiffer, Catwoman, like that was, I had a post, this poster that she has from Batman Returns on my wall forever when I was a kid, because I was <laughs> like, I want to be Catwoman. I want to be her. Her name's Michelle. It's meant to be. Uh, I was Catwoman for Halloween multiple times. And so that it was, it was, it was just like, I might have had a like little tear of joy of like, she said my name twice and she said Michelle Viber and she said Catwoman. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, for those really cool. who, yeah. For those of you who haven't watched it, it's pretty darn awesome. She does like kind of like a Google search and she's like, Michelle C. Smith. She's like, wow. Yeah. And then she's just like, oh my, oh my, oh my <laughs> yeah. God. Like she was just so like flabbergasted by your, your, your tricks and everything you were doing with the, the lightsaber. So yeah, yeah. Hence why I'm wearing my Star Wars Yay. shirt. So. <laughs> okay, so doing what you do requires you to be so strong. Tell us about your dedication to nutrition and training and any other things that uh, keep your mind and body strong. Uh, well, <laughs> I've gone through many a, a phase in my life, okay? So like, I, when I was young, we didn't really have, it was just a sign of the times. So we just didn't have very much education behind nutrition. Um, so nutrition has been one of the things that I've had to really educate myself on as a, an adult and a professional performer of what is meant to go in your body and what's not and learning about food. But then it's also taken me a really long time to sort of find what works for me. And I find that it changes because your body is always changing and shifting and I've done diets. I've lost a lot of weight for a show. Um, I've, I've experienced disordered eating for work. And, and then I've been uh, heavier than I have been before. Like I've, I've done all the things and there's a lot of, a lot of that is a mental health thing. And the more I've sort of sat down and focused on finding my own homeostasis and harmony and peace within, uh, the more successful things like diet and, and fitness training and my training in general, and just my overall uh, well-being is just better. Because as someone who has chronic anxiety, uh, my, my hormones are all over the place. There's a lot of adrenaline, like cortisol is like, uh, when it shouldn't be. Uh, so making sure that my sort of body is relaxed is is one of my top priorities again that's taken me a long time to sort of realize that uh the other thing is is I actually don't train as much as I used to at all I used to train every day when I was a kid and then throughout my entire 20s I was training at least five six days a week and then as I've gotten older I've started training less and less and less and what I've discovered is is you really, really, really have to be so in tune with your body. You have to listen because it changes on a daily basis. What you need today might be different than what you need tomorrow. So when you follow, and this is just for me, because some people do rigid schedules and structure really well, but if you're following something so rigid and it has so many rules, there's a lot at stake and then there's a lot to lose. Whereas if you could find a place where you know that your body is happy and healthy, you're going to have a much more positive experience around training and dieting and, and all of that. So for me, I like to say that I, my body is a Ferrari. 
Uh, this is a temple. So anything that goes into my body, it, it's my body's going to use it. So I know that if I eat a bunch of junk, I feel awful. And then I don't want to move. So then it makes me hard. It makes it harder to go train. Whereas if I'm eating good whole foods, I have ample amount of energy. It's being used in the correct ways. I'm more likely to get up and get moving. So there's that. Uh, I don't subscribe to any particular diet aside from drink water, drink a lot of it. Uh, try not to drink juice, uh, eat vegetables. Carbs are okay. And protein, eat protein. That's it. And you, you need your like oils and your fats and don't skip oils and fats. Low fat things don't work. Um, but big thing is water. You can, you can like, there's a lot of things and sensations that come up in your body because you're dehydrated. And I guarantee that most of us are not drinking enough water. Um, but then also on the training side is if you're tired and your body is asking you to rest, you should probably follow that. Doesn't mean that you're going to rest for the rest of your life, but, but if like, if right now what your body really needs is to take a nap or maybe your form of exercise today is some really low impact stretching or mobility work, that's still doing a good thing for your body. That is still training. And I think what I experienced in my competitive days, having literally no days off a year, we had Christmas day off and a couple days after Worlds, wouldn't go down well nowadays. But I, from that, I learned to just work and work and work and work and overwork. And, and that, like, when I talk about how many times I've cycled through burnout because of my conditioning of overworking, and I, I really, really, really believe that if you can get in tune with your body and that comes with like whatever mindful practice, mindfulness practice you need, if you can come into your body and, and just sort of ask your body on a daily basis, what do I need to perform at my highest level and then follow that, you will be so much more successful in, in training and your food intake and all of that, which is going to lead to better results in whatever your goals are, whether that be competitively or otherwise. Uh, and that's not something that we're taught. I think the fitness no. industry sort of lies to us and tells us that you, you got to run on the trail. No, no, I don't run on the treadmill. I run, my trainer makes me run on the treadmill for three minutes. And then I'm like, I give you three minutes tops and then I'm off. And nice. my cardio is fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you look pretty fit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, let's see here. We'll just have like two more questions. Um, sure. uh, where do you see yourself going in the future with all of this? Or do you have like a plan or any dream? Oh, <laughs> oh I have many a plan. I have many a vision. Uh, and it's been, it's been a number of years that I've sort of had the same vision, even though I haven't really known what the vision is, you know, like, I'm like, I know that I have to build something. I know that I have to be courageous and step out and create something of my own, because what I want from my career doesn't exist yet. It is up to me to create it. Here we are with freestyle staff. I'm creating it. So what I would love is for, uh, it to be a global lifestyle phenomenon that people do. It is really beneficial for your mental health. Obviously it's really great for you physically. It's really, really great for, for like confidence and feeling cool. Uh, my, the, really the people that are following me and are doing my classes and courses are people that just want to feel cool and who doesn't want to feel like more badass in their life. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I want that to, to be prevalent and, and I want uh, to be able to positively impact people's lives with freestyle staff. Uh, so I'm gonna build out my online academy. I'm gonna keep putting out a bunch of online courses for people to buy because uh, again, doing in-person classes isn't gonna happen right now and it just, buying classes online is really accessible. But eventually I wanna, I wanna author a book, several books. Uh, that's been in the works since I was 10 years old. Uh, 
You can ask cool. Loren about that. We've had many <laughs> conversations about that. Uh, and can I get a do, signed copy? Sorry. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and and then like I want to get more into speaking and really I just want to take the the brand of freestyle staff and the brand of Ms. Michelle C Smith and just go right to the top. There is no reason I can't be up there with Brene Brown and um, like Lewis Howes and those people. And I, I want to play at the top level. I'm used to playing at the top level. There's no reason why I can't play at the top level. You're so doing that's it. I'm going. Yeah. And You're it's just it. a daily, a daily thing. And uh, I'm, I have great support and, and like resources around me and, and I have the drive and the motivation. Like that's, I've had, it, I've been on this mission since the day I was born. The reason I was in Baton, why it was so serious and why I took it so seriously and why I didn't feel like I was done at the end of it in 2003 is it's all leading up to where we're going now. And if I can change the way people, the world sees Baton into something way cooler and more accessible, through freestyle staff, I'm going to do that because that's going to lead people back to Baton. So amazing. Um, Mandy's on our call, and I don't know if you Mandy. Saw her. So you, like Mandy, have really honed in um, and really made the whole COVID situation work for you. Like it's just, mm -hmm. and I applaud you for that because that is not Thank an you. easy feat seeing uh, like so many businesses fail. You have both really chosen to thrive and. Um, and really that is a choice, you know, rather than, yes. you know, be a victim. Um, yep. And I, I think with a little bit of luck as well, but I, you worked for it, like a hundred percent, you worked for it. Um, so congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. If, you. if you have any advice for coaches, athletes, or parents, uh, parents out there to stay inspired or motivated um, through all of this, especially during COVID, what would it be? Uh, honestly, Stop watching so much of the news, turn off your TVs and go do something outside. Or if that's not accessible to you, just go do something that's enriching for you, whether that's a puzzle or a something. I, right now we're getting blasted with so much fear. Um, um, like wherever you stand on everything, there's just fear. And that's, it's not a great vibration for our bodies. And, and that's one of the things that I chose right away. I don't watch literally any content at all. I don't watch TV. I don't watch movies. Like I, I am not on my phone all day. I'm not on my computer all day. So that's one of the things that sort of saved me, but that's my own uh, thing. It has really nothing to do. That was prior to COVID. Um, but yeah, it, it really is a choice. It's, it's really about reframing negative situations into positive ones. There is something for all of us to learn and grow from and evolve from in this situation that we are all in. And one of the things I took from it is the connectivity of all of us, how we are all going through this together. Every single person on this planet is affected by what is happening right now. And like, what an amazing, like not to diminish the tragedy of what's happening, but like what an amazing thing to have discovered is how connected we all are through all of this. And then focus on that, focus on all the good things. I listened to a lot of Abraham Hicks and I started doing a gratitude journal about three, four years ago. And it is something I have done every single day since then. So for three or four years, every single day, I have written down things I'm grateful, grateful for and or positive aspects of the day. So noticing all the things that are going right is going to put you in a much more positive frequency and mindset. So then you're going to start, it's like the red Volvo theory. You notice a red Volvo and then you start seeing red Volvos everywhere. I don't know if there are red Volvos, but you know what I mean. Um, but if you're focused on all the negative things, then all you're going to see is negative things. And then your energy is just going to go up and then you're going to feel crappy and you're not going to be able to move. You're not going to want to train. You're going to feel unmotivated because things are scary right now. There is an underlying frequency of terror that we're all feeling. And, and it doesn't mean that we pretend that it's not there. What it means is we are choosing to focus on the things that are working for us and following those. Following those things that make you happy and light you up 
will always lead you to a, a good place and it will always lead you to something amazing. And that's what I really, that's all I did during the lockdown. I was so burnt out and overworked until literally the day the film industry shut down. Like I was working right up until that day and then it all shut down. And the overwhelming feeling I had was relief of like, oh, finally I have time to do what I wanna do. And I gave myself two days off and I started doing live stream classes and I did a live stream class for almost 200 days in a row. And it was just about showing up. It was just about showing up with all these people who just needed a little bit of support and needed somebody who could stand up and just show up with them every day. And like, we would do a staff spinning class, but it, it was literally just about, we're gonna support each other. And these were like total strangers. Mm. And, and we're still going to do that because look how connected we are. We're, we're all doing this together and what a perfect time to uh, learn a new skill yeah. is when we all have space. So for like, sure. For sure. Well, I feel like Tony Robbins, <laughs> Steven, um, I feel truly grateful that you have joined us today and um, also provided us with your experiences your memories and your knowledge of what you've been going through I feel like we have so much to learn from you um oh, thank you and yeah and I feel like the stars aligned for us and I feel like um that was my mission putting this together is just mm -hmm. really you know for the people that it's working for and working well for we should be sharing that so we can learn so yeah yeah thank you very much yeah. Um, Thank you with, for having me. Yeah, yeah. That's the end of the formal questions. We're going to move on to our uh, little slideshow of Michelle oh, through, <laughs> through the years. I know. I um, know I want to see it. So make sure that at the top of your screen, you um, there's a little drop down and it, uh, make sure that your screen is fit to window. And then after that, we'll go through some rapid fire questions and then finish off sure. with some questions from the audience. Sure. All right. right. So <laughs> some fun. quite the, it's quite the journey. I love it, that. It's funny when you watch it like that. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty awesome. Uh, I'm so glad we captured your four turn inside walkover catch. That was right. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm never okay. going to stop talking about that. <laughs> That's so awesome. All right. So let's go to the rapid fire questions. We'll go through them as fast as we possibly can. One word answers yeah. if you can. Um, yeah. And then uh, we'll move to the questions from the audience. Okay. So uh, what's the best thing that happened to you this month? This month, I moved into a loft. Oh, cool. Uh, favorite board game? Uh, board game, Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> when are you most inspired? Uh, when? Yeah. Oh, like 8 a.m. 8 a.m. <laughs> um, if you could teach one subject in school, what would it be? Uh, science. Science. <laughs> what's your favorite beverage? Uh, I like water. Uh, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Uh, I, I like that uh, when people tell me that I'm inspiring them. That you are. Um, what is the one thing you still have from your childhood? Uh, I have batons. I have a, a cat stuffed animal that I got for catching my very first triple. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Uh, Batman Returns or the Jason Bourne trilogy. Mm, awesome. Uh, what is something you can't do? Uh, a, any acrobatic skill. <laughs> <laughs> a window or a aisle seat? <laughs> uh, window or aisle again? seat? Uh, aisle. Uh, what makes you laugh no matter what? Cards Against Humanity. <laughs> what are your favorite lyrics of all time? <laughs> I can't see the one that came okay. in my head. Okay. <laughs> it was a Prince song. <laughs> oh, okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> if you could raid one person's closet, who would it be? Oh, uh, who's got the most Lululemon? Whoever that is. Uh, what did you want to be when you grow up? Grew up when you're around the age of twelve. Uh, twelve? Not sure. But when I was like seven, I was going to be a paleontologist and dig up dinosaur bones. Cool. Uh, what is something you will not be doing in 10 years? Um, <laughs> a walk <-overse. laughs> <laughs> What is the most important life lesson for someone to learn? Uh, that you create your own reality. You are the creator. So anything you want, you can have. 
What's your favorite dessert? Carrot cake. And last question, what's your favorite Star Wars character? Darth Vader. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. All right, that ends our um, questions. Um, that was stressful. Rest. Was it? <laughs> My hands All are right. still sweaty. <laughs> I need rosin. <laughs> um, all right. So for anyone out there, um, you can either put a question in the chat or you can uh, take yourself off of mute and put your hand up. Um, floor is open. Alicia, I know you have questions. <laughs> you can answer the one in the chat first. Oh, okay. Uh, Christino uh, asks, what, have you, what has been your favorite stunt role and why? Um... Obviously, Deadpool was a was a pretty remarkable experience uh, for me. Just sort of the way it came up and how it played out. I had a really positive experience uh, on that show, and it was the first time I doubled a lead character in a feature film, like a big feature film. Uh, so that was it, there was a lot of firsts for me, and it was the first time I felt like I was a part of the team. Uh, I had felt before that that I was just like some kid that wanted to do stunts and, and that was the show where I really sort of solidified myself. They worked me hard. They tested me as they uh, like to do in stunts where they, they gave me a bunch of gnarly gags to rehearse and they wanted to see me crack and I didn't crack. Well, they didn't see me crack, but I didn't crack in front of them. That's awesome. Um, I think I was the most annoying person in the world because uh, when Deadpool came out on, I think it was maybe Netflix, uh, I watched it and made my husband re rewind it like several times. I'm like, oh, that's Michelle. Oh, that's Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I've watched it like three times. Oh, so, yeah. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, Leisha, you're up. Sure. Um, hello. I Hi. Have, first, I have a couple pictures to show you because I just can't. Oh, excellent. So um, here's a little one of you. Oh my God, hold on. I'm going to pin your video. Do that again. Flexibility. Oh my God, I tried that the other day when I tried to recreate my freestyle and it did not work like that. <laughs> well, this, one, this is like 96, so you know, you might want to just do a little stretching. Uh, here's a little yeah. picture from World in Hawaii, I think. Oh, cute. And the last one is the, what you're talking about, about the peeling of the... Uh, Oh, yeah. God, that was gross. You guys were, it was third degree burns, for, for sure. I mean, you guys Oh, were, it was gross. It was gross. I have vivid memories of that. <laughs> um, I had to have one, uh, one question. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching with you in uh, England and Scotland many years ago, it feels like. Um, yes. The first time, uh, you know, being with you on that trip was probably, uh, this was the first time I, I'd been to to England and Scotland and teaching. And since then, I, I, I've gone back and worked with Edinburgh now for 12 years. So it must have been Ooh. years ago that we, that we went. But, um, you know, I know you're doing lots of teaching now. And I just want to know what for you is uh, the most rewarding or the best part of teaching and, and also what are some of the challenges that you've come across? Yeah, that's a great question. I, what I'm really loving about teaching now is, is because I'm not teaching kids, which is awesome uh for me <laughs> I I, kids aren't my demographic and <laughs> that's okay um but I really love that I'm sharing these skills with just regular people and what I love is is when they discover that they can do it because what they see is so magical that they feel like they can't get in there and then just like within 10 minutes you can have them doing something that they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing it. And granted, it's like not fabulous, but they're still doing it. And that moment where they sort of click in and then they're like, I'm hooked. I love that. But I also love um, the moment where you sort of get somebody into an intermediate, high beginner intermediate space and you're teaching them like a toss catch backhand or something. And they're dropping and dropping and dropping. And you're just like, yep. Yeah, do it again, do it again, do it again. And and I, one of my biggest things with freestyle staff is drop your staff because I felt like it wasn't safe for me to drop my baton. And that's one of the things that really messed with my head because the world was going to explode if I dropped my baton. That's what I believed. And so I just want to make sure that I'm telling people, just drop your staff. It's okay. You have to drop your staff. 
But there's that moment and we all know what it is where you drop it a bazillion times and then you catch it and it is elation and it is so satisfying and there is no other feeling in the world. And having other people discover that and they're like, oh my God, I can't, I need, and you're like, yep, that, that is, that is the hook. That's what gets people into it. And, and having the space where it's just like, you know, it's okay. This is part of the process. You're going to do it. You're right on the edge because you're touching it. The number one rule is if you touch it, you can catch it. So you're just on the precipice and just watching that determination, uh, that that's it. And that can happen at any level. Like it still happens to me. I still go through that. Yeah. Um, some of the challenges I'm coming up with, uh, are, I'm, I'm kind of getting tired of teaching uh, basic flow, which is forward and reverse figure eights. So I'm actively trying to shift my academy to where I show up. If you want access to me, it's in the higher levels and just create courses to support people through the beginner levels. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now. Like I, I'm so tired of teaching forward and reverse figure eights. I really, really am. I have several tutorials online for it. Go watch one of those. <laughs> But, but it's so important that people do those skills right. So I don't want to discount it because if you can't do forward and reverse figure eights, you can't do anything. Yeah. It's yeah. Like that's it. So that's awesome. I'm so proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Leisha. <laughs> um, Michelle, there's one of your followers who's getting quite proficient. His name's Michael something. I don't know. Yeah. He wears short shorts. Mike. Yeah, yeah. It's like he's he's doing awesome. Like so, I so I good. love watching people grow, and even just the beginners. That one woman who kept hitting the ceiling because her staff was mm -hmm. too long. I was like, oh, yeah. you're doing so yeah. great. Keep it up. Yeah. And you're just like you you always put like some sort of meme that's like, yes, keep it up, do it. Yeah, because that's really all it is. Like mm -hmm. people want to know. Like you you if you go and read some of the comments, people are like, how do I learn this? I want to learn this and. You, like you learn it by doing it like this mm -hmm. is a skill of repetition and and in order for that to work out in the world you have to sell that you have to sell the 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 drop basically yeah. is is what i've found and like some of these people like amira and mike and and some of the other people i i love that i know them all by name uh i really made an effort to connect with the people who are following me and taking my classes. I think that's really, really important. Um, but they've only been training since the beginning of the lockdown and look how good they are. No way. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> like, Crazy. Some people just get it. Some people it's harder for just depending right. on how your brain's wired. But like yeah. when you get it, you get it. Yeah. I just like the look in people's face, whether they're good or bad, like that they're just like, you know, they're just yeah. so yeah. immersed in it. Okay. We have a question from Zoe Boyd. Uh, how many movies slash shows have you been in? I have a zero idea. Um, <laughs> I'll, to give you an idea, I've been, I started stunts and working in film around 2008. Uh, and have been working consistently since then. The last three, four years, I have been fully booked, barely any days off, like two weeks off was the most I had. Um, I was experiencing sort of overbooking and being like double, triple booked, which is a very wonderful problem to have, but it's not sustainable. Uh, so yeah, I do have IMDB. It's sort of up to date uh, from what I can remember. I, I have to update it from memory because I, I don't usually pay attention to what episodes I'm on when I go on a TV show, but I've done some stuff. Uh, yeah, it's all in my IMDb. <laughs> you don't find it. Awesome. Uh, so there's oh, 30, 32 oh, IMD. <laughs> so that means I've worked on 32 shows. Uh, they used to do it like every episode you work on on a show, they would count it as a like credit, but they stopped doing that. So I've worked on 32 shows. Cool. That's what that means. Awesome. Steven, you have a question. Hey, what's up? Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm still trying to wait for that feeling you were talking about of when you catch a baton. I had never experienced that <laughs> feeling. So, um, but so yeah, I mean, obviously within within your your line of of work, you had mentioned is an inherent risk for, for injuries and stuff. Um, have you had any serious injuries and what have you had to do to, to kind of work through some of those things? Uh, 
well, it's an ongoing process. I will say that. But there, there's like, I've been using my body for 32 years. So there's a lot of wear and tear. A lot of my injuries come from overuse. My, a lot of my injuries come from me not taking care of myself when I was younger. Because again, we just didn't have the education. It wasn't part of our curriculum when we were competing. Uh, so I've had to learn how to take care of my injuries, which it's, it's been sort of like the diet thing where I'm like, oh, I actually have to put ice on things or I actually have to like go see somebody for this elbow thing that I have. Um, I've had a few uh, decent ones. Uh, most notably, I have a torn uh, inferior glenohumeral humeral ligament in my shoulder and it's torn from my humerus, not the labrum. So that makes it very challenging. I've seen three surgeons. All of them have said that I'm not a candidate for surgery. So basically, here we are. Uh, so that means I'm doing shoulder stability all the time. Uh, and it, it, like, there's certain things that hurt me now and that I don't do because of that. Uh, I've, I've done some things to my ribs. I've had compounding whiplash. There is some concussion stuff in there too. Uh, and that was sort of happening before we started really talking about concussions in stunts the last couple of years. Um, but I've had whiplash a lot. So like, like talking about walkovers, my thoracic spine doesn't bend anymore. I only bend in my low back and I can't put my head back anymore without my body like doing this. So walkovers do not happen. Um, uh, there's been like knee things, hip things. My hip is a little bit weird right now. Uh, pulled some intercostals a bunch of years ago, um, but nothing, knock on wood, nothing crazy. Um, I've, I feel like my body is pretty sturdy. I have really dense bones. Um, so I, I feel like I've been able to withstand a lot, but I've been bumped and bruised quite a bit. Um, but it, it's a really an ongoing thing. And when you're working on set, it's really challenging when you're on a show and you're working 12 to 15 hours every day to get the care and the maintenance that you need because it just your schedule doesn't allow for it. So then you're having to like, make special deals with with physios and being like can I come in on Sunday I know you don't work on Sundays but I really need it and and it's about again it's about creating relationships I think that had I done better when I was younger with my injuries I think I would be in a very different position now but I definitely feel like my body's changed a lot since like it my end of my 20s into my 30s I've I've noticed how much my body has changed in like every couple of years, I sort of wake up and I'm like, wow, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And the, I don't need to do this anymore. And, and that's really just to keep myself, I wanna be moving forever. I don't wanna ever stop moving. I'm always gonna be an athlete. But if I continue to do the things that I was doing, say when I was like 14 or even 22 or 26, I mean, that's not gonna happen. So. <laughs> about longevity at this point and yeah like it, it's it's been a it's been a it's been a ride but I think that I've been pretty lucky with with injuries aside from the shoulder thing that's just there but the hard part is is when I go into physios or even surgeons and I show them videos they're like oh, I've never dealt with anybody like you before and they're like you're kind of like a high level pitcher or swimmer like if, if we go in there, you're not going to have the same mobility that you've been working on for 32 years. So maybe let's not do that. And yeah. Yeah. Cool. One more quick question. When did you yeah. go from Michelle Smith to Michelle C. Smith and why? Uh, because every time I go to the dentist, there's 12 Michelle Smiths. <laughs> and I just, I just wanted a little bit of mystery of like the C because I want people to be like, what does the C stand for? And I'll be like, Catwoman. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Get it together. Jeez. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Uh, it's too bad Stephen wasn't around you. Then he could help you out being the athlete. I'm, you know, you probably could, Stephen. <laughs> I, 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 got, I know people in Vancouver. <laughs> hook me send up. Me a hook send me, me up. a message. We'll, I'll, 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 I'll find out exactly where you are. I'll hook you up. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's awesome. All right, Mandy. Yes. Last question hey, Mandy. now. Hey, how are you Hi, doing? Hi, Miss Mandy. 
Hi. I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, okay, so uh, m one of my favorite parts about Michelle C. Smith is that she says she's going to do something, and then she goes out and she does it. And uh, I remember after the twirling thing, you said that you were going to go meet Nick Carter from the Backstreet <laughs> Boys, and you took off to L.A. I think that you just got on a plane. Somehow yeah. you got yourself a backstage pass, pretended to be a massage therapist, got into yeah. the green room, and met the guy. I mean, who does yeah. that? That's just crazy. Me. Yeah, you I do. do. I know. So my question is, where did that come from? That belief that you could just say you were going to do it and then you were going to do it. Is that intrinsic or was that built into you through uh, external influences? And my second question, follow up on that is, is there anything that you said you're going to do that you're still about to do? Yeah, there's a lot of things I said I'm about to, I'm going to do. Um, re your first question. Uh, I feel like there's been many moments in my life where I have had to actively choose to step up. Um, one of the moments was when I didn't, the only year I didn't make it to Worlds was the first year I did freestyle, junior A freestyle, and Holly and Chelsea made it, and it was devastating. And it was because I had dropped like a compulsory and that had dropped me out of even being in contention um and it being upsetting but then deciding that those two were going to go practice all summer for world's practice and I was just like I'm not gonna let them go without because we were a team like we were together all the time I'm not just gonna sit around and have a vacation I'm gonna go practice every single day with them and just that choice was like, I'm never not gonna make it, not gonna make it to world ever again. And I never did. I, I, I made it to world ever after that. Um, there were moments earlier in my childhood where I saw that, cause Holly and her sisters were always practicing more. And I was just like, I remember saying to my mom, mom, I wanna go to the gym, I wanna practice. Um, things like that where I, I don't know where that comes from, but I, I think if you ask my mom, she said that she would probably say that it was pretty like, willed strong-willed child I am an Aries so that does make sense but I've always had a sense of mission and I don't know where that comes from aside from before coming here being like this is what I'm going to do in this life and I feel that every day and so I feel like everything I've done in my life has been leading me to wherever I'm going now so I think it just comes with uh whatever this is, um, it's harder sometimes than others. Sometimes it's an easy decision to say I'm going to do things. Other times it's, it's really something I have to really dig deep for. But uh, I feel like, again, one of my core values is integrity. And if I say I'm going to do something, I need to stay in my integrity and do it. Um, what was your second question? I may have ADHD myself out of that. That's forgot. okay. Um, what have you said you're going to do that you haven't done yet that's still on the list? Oh, uh, still on the list. Okay, so uh, it all has to do with my business. I've been talking about building courses and building out my academy for a long time. I've been talking about wanting to write this book and really like focus my world on building my business and being an entrepreneur and stepping up in the world that way. And I feel like I've been constantly pulled back into film, uh, whether through it's because it's a comfortable environment, it's something that I know uh, financially, it's sometimes it's a good decision. Uh, but where I'm at right now is I've, I've actually created space for myself to uh, not be working in film right now. I just finished a season on a show on March 31st, and I am not taking any more film work for at least a year. Uh, because I need the space to work on my business and work on the things that are really fulfilling me. So there, that's where like I'm really standing in my integrity of like, I've been talking about building this thing for years. We've had conversations about it. And uh, for whatever reason, it, it just some sort of fear and procrastination and discomfort has always been like, oh, I get close and then I pull back. And then I get close and then I pull back. And so it's it's just... It's at a certain point, you just got to go for it. And that's, that's where I'm at now. So I'm doing it. I'm going to, and I'm like, I am 100% writing a book. 
it's it's actually like 80 percent already written it's just not organized or outlined it, in any capacity it now, so now you really do have to do yeah, it i, know I do i gotta do it gonna happen um just one last question have you ever lost an aerial contest to someone and it's just really eaten you up inside uh no never <laughs> never never yeah. and it was never uh right side elbow pops uh where yeah. i slipped on a baton and did them but slipped on a baton and who who won was... that contest do you remember uh no i don't mm. i you know i don't think anybody really won that <laughs> I don't you know I started working on those elbow pops because I told you I was going to do 30 but they hurt my shoulder so bad going in that direction that I'm like the next day I'm like I can't move my arm so okay. you might That's just okay. win forever Mandy <laughs> That's awesome thanks Mandy All right so <laughs> you know I feel like with the lockdowns that are going on in Manitoba Ontario Alberta DC across the world you know I feel mm -hmm. like um, and I, I'll say, I said it before and I'll say it again, like, this is exactly what we need. Uh, we need people who inspire us, who are doing it and who continue to do it. And, um, yeah, I hope the takeaway from this is for the athletes, the coaches, the board members, the parents, um, to still feel really inspired. Cause I know after I have one of these meetings with our guests I feel like a million bucks like I can't even sleep because I'm just so excited so, <laughs> and you have Yay. you never cease to amaze me Michelle we're all again super proud of you we're so thank so you happy very much that you joined us tonight um oh Ron has something to say real quick <laughs> yeah hi Michelle um, hi Ron you are such a strong and wonderful woman and thank I you. always and all those many years ago when you and your competitions, I always was hoping that I was going to be judging you when you did, always did a wonderful thing. Everything you're talking about today is just saying again, that wonderful person that you are. Love you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate that. Thanks, Ron. Ron has, always has something nice to say. But oh, everybody, no. He's such a good man. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Um, Michelle, I need you to stay on the line, but uh, we're taking a break next weekend because it's the long weekend. And, you know, because we're on lockdown, we have crazy busy lives at home. Um, but the weekend after that, we have Aman Hussein, who's a sports psychologist who works with the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, which is really mm. cool. You blend uh, the sports part and the artistry part together. So that is our last of our um, inspiration series and then Manitoba Baton has something really cool up their sleeves to um, for you to enjoy so again thank you to our guest Michelle C. Smith yay thank you to all of you who joined us this evening have a wonderful rest of your evening and weekend we will see you in two weeks when Amon is in all right have a good night okay. everybody take care thank Bye. you, Bye. Thank you Kristen Bye.